We welcome you, and uh, Ms. Chase, would you call the roll, please? Vice Chair Schenck? Here. Vice Chair Richards? Here. Mr. Umberg? Here. Mr. Burns? Here. Mr. Hartnett? Here. Mr. Balganor? Mr. Rossi? Chairman Richard? Here. Nope. Thank you very much. We have a quorum, and I'd like to uh, start the meeting today first by, again, welcoming you and to uh, give you an outline of what we intend to do today. We've got a pretty lengthy uh, agenda. Uh, what we intend on doing is to uh, try to take care of all items uh, 7 through 17. And as is our custom, we will take public comments uh, in the beginning of the meeting. Um, as you know, I see a number of you were here yesterday. We had uh, public comments on the uh, final uh, Merced Fresno EIR EIS. And today, and we also received some 20 letters, uh, which members of the board reviewed yesterday uh, and yesterday evening, along with comments you made yesterday. We're not going to take any further comments on the EIR EIS today, but let me clarify that. If anyone wishes to comment on agenda item number 10 today, and let me uh, read that to you just so you understand, that's consideration of a resolution to certify the Merced Fresno section EIR EIS. We do want to hear your comments. We're going to leave the comment period per uh, comment at two minutes uh, based upon the number of people we see here. Uh, if a number of other people come, as you may also have noted, this item, num numbers 9 and 10, regarding the uh, Fresno Merced EIR EIS, is scheduled for hearing today at 10 o'clock. So in order to ensure that we get all of your comments on this item, we will go ahead and accept your uh, green cards, which you should uh, have given the secretary, or please do so, and we will allow you to um, get your comments and, as I mentioned, leave those at two minutes. So with that, we'll start. Oh, I'm sorry. We have the pledge. I, I wanted to ask Vice Chair Shank to lead us in the pledge. Thank you. You all please rise, face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I guess I should also state that uh, Chair Richard did not leave the board. Uh, he was just out of uh, the state, unfortunately, today. And so Vice Chair Shank and myself will uh, carry on the duties of chairing this meeting today. So thank you for your indulgence. Beginning with the public comments first is uh, Supervisor Henry Perea. And the supervisor will be followed by Ed McIntyre. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Uh, I was going to speak on the item when you certify the EIR. Are you going to have individual comments? We're going to do that. We're going to take all comments right now, yes. Oh, all comments now? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Well, just wanted to, again, welcome you to Fresno and acknowledge the historic decision that you all are going to be making today. And many years from now, people will look back and wonder where the decision was made. Uh, they'll know it was here. And two, um, it certainly is an economic game changer for Fresno County. This. This gets uh, going for California, gets built, and uh, we're going to know that the home was right here in Fresno and you were part of making that decision. So again, thank you and stay the course. Thank you very much, and it's good to be home, Henry. Um, Mr. McIntyre, and followed by uh, Michael Hogan. Good morning, Vice Chair Richard and members of the authority. Um, this is truly a historic moment, and this is uh, year four for me working on this project. Uh, I represent the Gordon Shaw Properties uh, Heavy Maintenance Facility site, and I'm here just to reiterate the expression of interest that we made two, two years ago. We're offering 250 acres, and I want you to know that the site is being master planned in conjunction with Madera County now uh, and the surrounding 1,100-acre site. <clears throat> I also wanted to let you know that despite the concerns about the financial feasibility, 
this group, after four years of study um, and looking at independent studies and the empirical evidence, is hereby offering to commit up to $1 billion in private sector investment to construct a heavy maintenance facility and ancillary and cell, uh, facilities. We've already expended a, a significant amount of money in the studies and are convinced of the viability of California. There are 20,000 miles of high-speed rail either operating, planned, or under construction elsewhere. And California's demographics and the per capita income are as high or higher than anywhere else in the world. So we're convinced and excited and are willing to present you with a, a letter of intent to that uh, regard. To those that want further study or planning, I've had friends that have been involved in this for, for over 20 years. Uh, I think we've planned enough. Uh, I encourage you to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your efforts, especially uh, Vice Chair Shank and Member Umberg, who have been here for lo those many years. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, uh, would you just repeat the, the dollar number that your client is willing to invest? Okay. Um, I'm you also, might want to spell it. Okay. I'm part of the, I am part of the group as well, and we have submitted a, a site that will also contain a maintenance of way facility and the command and control facility based on your technical memos and best case scenario for, for the uh, heavy maintenance facility and that complex. So our, our heavy maintenance facility site is estimated at $668 million. In addition to that, we're willing to uh, construct the maintenance of way facility which is logistically perfect at this site. We're just south of the Y, so we can serve as yeah, just the dollar amount. One billion dollars. Okay, thank you. So there you have a, a private sector investment offer publicly. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a B. With a B. <laughs> yeah, with a B. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Mr. Hogan, followed by uh, Cheryl Smith. Hello, my name is Michael Hogan, and I'm here representing actually three groups from the Santa Clarita Valley. The first group, I'm a resident of Roadrunner Road in Sand Canyon. This road is also known right now as High Speed Railroad. Both route options in this SAA go right down my street. And this area is very unique for LA County. These aren't just row houses or tract homes, which there's nothing wrong with that. These are two to 20 acre horse properties and the train blasts through a beautiful rural area full of protected heritage oak trees, displacing families who have lived there on average 20 years. All of our children were born and grew up there. I invite all of you to come down and look at this area before you build a train there. I'm here also as a board member of the Sulphur Springs Elementary School District. As proposed, this high-speed rail is so close to two elementary schools in this area that it will put over a thousand elementary students in danger and the sound will impact the learning in the classrooms. The district has major concerns over this, and they're addressed in a letter that was delivered to the board on June 20th, 2011, which I have copies for you. None of these concerns are referenced in the SAA, which I was a little disappointed in. In fact, they're completely ignored. So I have these copies for you. Third, I'm here as chair of the newly formed Santa Clarita Valley High Speed Rail Task Force. The purpose of forming this task force is to reach out to more of our own community and to represent the interest of these residents regard, with regard to the high-speed rail. There has been much feedback to you guys from the Santa Clarita Valley, unfortunately, and we're finding as we reach out to the community, we find the majority don't even know anything about the high-speed rail coming through our community. That is disappointing, but it's true. Once they're aware, they're shocked. The high-speed rail is proposed to pass through Canyon Country, and there's a reason for that name. We are in a canyon. Sound echoes off the mountains on both the north and south ends of canyon country. It will change the landscape of the east side of the Santa Clarita Valley and the sound impacts will be irreversibly negative for thousands of residents. As the city representative did last board meeting before this item was postponed until today, I ask that the board keep the option of extending the current tunnel coming from Silmar by two miles as an alternative. This this will take the train past all residential, commercial, and all schools in this area. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Thank you for Is coming up today. Somebody I can give these letters to? Yes, please. Cheryl Smith, followed by Stephen Valenziano. Ms. Smith. Okay. Good morning. Thank you very much for letting me speak uh, off of the top agenda topics. I'm here to call to your attention to a socioeconomic consequence of the high-speed rail. A purported benefit for the HSR is that it will provide unemployed workers the access they need to obtain jobs outside the city, their city of residence. This assumption creates the illusion that the rail itself would expand job opportunities by affording easy access to available jobs away from one's home base. This is a fallacy that needs to be exposed. To elucidate this point, we need to look at the 11 to 11.9 unemployment rate that's held fast for the last year and a half or so. That's down, of course, from tw the atrocious 20% that we had in many counties in California in 2010. Yet it's still significantly higher than, than two or three, um, significantly higher than all but two or three other states in the nation. This is a disgrace to us. Are we to be proud that we've come down since 2010? Of course not. We should be urgently and actively involved in doing what is necessary to reverse it. We simply need to create jobs now. Similarly, are we the taxpayers to feel relief at the revised $68.4 billion that you've presented to us? Definitely not. Even the reduced cost projection is an obscene amount of money because it is money diverted away from immediate, practical, and effective solutions to the problem of unemployment in our state. If, un if employment opportunities do not significantly improve, then the rail itself, like the infamous bridge to nowhere, will reach a dead end. It will serve as a vehicle not to improve access to jobs, but to deliver workers to a job devoid of worker and human rights and or union representation. Allow me to explain. Ms. Smith, could you yes. try to finish up as soon as you can, please? I did request two more minutes, and I suppose that's being denied? No, we only, we, we're only so it's not, two minutes. Yes, please. It's not allowed. I mean, if you'd like to finish it, your, your thought right now, that would be fine. Um, diverting money? to this high-speed rail will degrade working conditions all over the state because of the high levels of competition that workers will hold within their hands, or employers will hold within their hands. Workers then are faced okay. with being replaced by others all over the state. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Stephen Valenciamo. If I hope I'm saying that correctly, and then Bill Padilla. Yes, Mr. Chairman, board members, good morning. Uh, Steve Valenziano, also from Santa Clarita this morning. I'm here wearing two hats. One, I'm also a member of the Santa Clarita Valley uh, High Speed Rail Task Force that Mr. Hogan mentioned. And secondly, I'm a development partner for the Vista Canyon Project, uh, which is a 90-acre multi-use development, um, which uh, is scheduled to provide a job center and an amenity base for the east side of our town, which is sorely lacking at the moment. One of the alignments of the train that I believe you're going to look at in the AR exits the uh, tunnel right in the middle of our uh, job center and commercial core. This would be a terrible loss for the city. Uh, here to make two points this morning. One, I'd like to reemphasize, as mentioned by Michael Murphy of the City of Santa Clarita in Sacramento, to please consider in the EIR uh, continuing the tunnel to save the eastern side of our community. And the other point would be that the Chairman Richard, a few weeks ago in Sacramento, offered to schedule permitting visit the communities of Acton, and we would hope also Santa Clarita just to the south, and we'd like to coordinate a time for that so that uh, the board is very f aware of what the train will be doing to our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valenciano. 
Next, uh, Bill Padilla. Uh, good morning, members of the authority. I'm Bill Padilla, and I'm here representing the city of Palmdale. Uh, item number eight discusses uh, two alignment going to the city of Palmdale, and we want to mention that the city prefers the easterly alignment. The reason being is because we already have a multimodal station uh, in the easterly alignment. It also, the city in previous years has been working heavily, uh, and we have changed the general plan to provide a transit-oriented development along that site. In addition, uh, the existing sta station there, uh, we have uh, right away next to Metrolink and Union Pacific, which will help to the new approach, you have the blended approach, uh, will help on that type of design. Uh, we would like also to thank the design team that is working closely with city staff in the technical issues and the alignment. Issues like the great separations, how this alignment will affect the city streets, which is very important to look ahead. We work in the 5% design right now, and we're very happy that we are discussing issues with the design team. Uh, we willing to help in any way we can help to work with the UP Railroad because it'd be a challenge to obtain the right of way to, to go to that city. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. Mr. Dolan, I, I see you've got a, uh, I'm not sure if you intend this just to be a written communication or if you uh, wish to. Just a quick comment. Yes, sir. Well, could you just step to the microphone, please? And Mr. Dolan will be uh, followed by uh, Ms. Forestier. My name is Ian Dolan. I represent Stewart Title and in Global and Western States Title Services. Um, I was pleased that Dan Richard told us to uh, investigate the cap and trade assembly bill number 32. I found that interesting. And last night I looked at Karen Green Ross's uh, comments for item number 15, and I was reminded of a, an assembly bill that I wanted to call to your attention. Uh, Mr. Flens, that might be important in the future, and that's uh, Joe Simeon's Assembly Bill number 1235 that cries out about what's going to happen for indemnifications of public agencies with the demise of the redevelopment agencies that used to have some indemnification for brownfield project redevelopment and uh, EPA cleanup costs, and I just wanted to say that perhaps uh, your staff might want to check into this and talk to your eminent domain lawyers to see if there's some type of indemnification that the high-speed rail authority could seek ahead of time in case when you do your new constructions you run across old abandoned railroad properties or other contamination contaminated sites so that you don't want to have to pay to clean up. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. Ms. Forestier. Welcome. I'm back. Thank you for being there. Oh, Chair and member of the board. Um, I know I've got two minutes, so I'll make it brief. Um, I'm here to, at this point, to object to the final findings. Um, as I said yesterday, as far as the, oh, I'm Valerie Forestier. I represent one of the eight historic landmarks in Fresno that's little more than a plaque. Okay? I run historic tours. And um, the Forestry Underground Gardens is being threatened by the lack of due process. As I said yesterday, we are on the National Register of Historic Places, and as such, are due more consideration than what your response to my remarks yesterday say is, oh, we, uh, you were on our mailing list to inform you of, of, mess, of meetings. Does not historic landmark status entitle you to a little more consideration than that? Under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, we should have been consulted. There should have been meetings and hearings. In addition, the, because the California State Historic Preservation Office should have contacted my father and my family and invited us under CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, to do deliberation. There have been no hearings from the City of Fresno on the Historic Preservation Office. 
I doubt the mayor has even ever been to the underground gardens, much less the council members. We have casual contact with some people in the historic societies, but this type of, you know, an $100 billion project should require some documentation and some due inspection. And in addition to that, part of the city, Fresno has a highway city-specific plan that talks about influence to the underground gardens to protect this resource. And again, I find it insulting to the people of Fresno that you say that there is, in your conclusions, that you have contacted and worked with the city of Fresno Historic. We have no records of that. I would like to see documentation evidence that that has occurred and what the result findings were and how they came to any kind of findings without contacting the owners and the historic property of the property. And my last comment, since I got buzzed out here, is that your final remark, again, just, you know, insulting again, that you state categorically the project would cause no indirect physical destruction or damage that could result from construction or operation from vibration effects. Okay, you tell me what studies were done on this type of historic property. We are not a reinforced underground bunker here. We are one block from this, and this will be the basis for future litigation if not more due process is done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments. We have no other speaker cards. I encourage anybody else who wishes to speak to please fill out a green card and give it to the secretary. What we'll do in the interim, our next hearing, as I mentioned earlier, on the action on the Fresno Merced EIR EIS is scheduled for 10 o'clock. In the interim, in the interim, we're going to move, with the permission of my colleagues, we'll move to item number 11, which is to adopt and approve the limited English proficiency plan. And Mr. Francesca, thank you. Good morning, Vice Chairman Richards and board members. I'm here to present the limited English proficiency plan for the authority. I wasn't quite ready for this, so bear with me as I gather my notes. Is it possible you can get a little bit closer to that microphone? Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now I can't see my notes. Thank you. Today, the authority presents the limited English proficiency policy and plan for your adoption, approval, and authorization to have the interim CEO, Mr. Falenz, sign the policy and transmit the policy and plan to the Federal Railroad Administration. And I did have a slide. Nam, thank you for the audience. The limited English proficiency policy, it is the policy of the California High Speed Rail Authority to communicate effectively and provide meaningful access to limited English proficient individuals on all the authority's programs, services, and activities. The authority shall provide free language assistance services to limited English proficient individuals whom we encounter or whenever a limited English proficient individual requests language assistance services. The authority will treat limited English proficient individuals with dignity and respect. Language assistance will be provided through a variety of methods to include staff interpreters, translation and interpreter services contracts, formal arrangements with local organizations providing interpretation and translation services, or through telephonic interpreter services. The authority shall develop and maintain the limited English proficiency plan in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Presidential Executive Order 13166, and California state law under the Dimely Elatory Bilingual Services Act. That would be the policy for the authority. The limited English proficiency plan complies with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and as directed by the Federal Railroad Administration. The limited English proficiency plan supplements the Title VI plan that was approved by the board in March of this year. Limited English proficiency is a term used to describe individuals who do not speak English as their primary language and who have limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. As a recipient of federal financial assistance from Federal Railroad Administration, the authority is required to ensure non-discrimination to individuals who are limited English proficient and to have access to the authority's programs and services in, language, in a language understood by the individual. 
The plan is designed to assist management, staff, and consultants to understand their roles and responsibilities with respect to removing barriers for limited English proficient individuals and provide meaningful access to the authority's programs and services. The authority's Title VI coordinator is also known as the Language Access Coordinator. The, the Language Access Coordinator will conduct an annual self-assessment utilizing four factors. Factors include identifying the number or proportion of limited English proficient individuals to be served. Second is to identify the frequency with which limited English uh, individuals will come in contact with the authority. Third is identify the nature and importance of our services and the resources available to provide the limited English uh, access. The plan will be monitored on an annual basis. Data will be collected, analyzed, and the demographics analysis will be updated on a yearly basis. As new groups are identified, as we progress with the project either north or south or move into operations, the language, uh, limited English proficiency will change. The um, factors, the demographic factors that were analyzed for this particular project indicates that Spanish is the predominant language that needs limited English proficiency assistance. As you heard yesterday, we, we had an individual that came in that requested that assistance and was glad to provide that for him. The uh, authority will be providing limited English proficiency assistance to Spanish speakers in California and the services that we'll be providing through our resources is having two individuals in, at the authority who are available to provide that uh, translation and interpreter services. The authority also has an I speak card that has the various languages, up to 44 languages, that self-identifies that individuals' needs. The, um, the authority has also uh, translated a, a web page that has uh, Spanish-speaking documents uh, in and the vital documents that have been posted on that particular web page is the uh, business, uh, business plan, executive summary, the revised business plan, executive summary, and various EIR documents. Today I ask the authority to approve resolution HSR 1215 and authorize the interim CEO to sign the policy, approve the limited English proficiency plan, and, and authorize the CEO to uh, transmit the LEP plan to Federal Road Administration. With your approvals of these two requests, the policy and plan will be posted on the authority's website as well as transmitted to consultants, authority staffs, the shortlisted firms, and subrecipients of our funding so that they too can comply with the limited English proficiency requirements. Thank you, Ms. Fonseca. Uh, any uh, questions or uh, comments from my colleagues? Vice Chair Shank? Uh, thank you. Um, let me just explain that I ask these questions uh, as daughter of immigrants for whom English was not a first language. Uh, what uh, is it? Any language? Um, Hungarian, Bulgarian? Uh, I mean, any person who comes in with limited English proficiency, we provide the kinds of services that you have described. On, on the rule, it is at least if five percent of the population needs the uh, services that we will provide that automatically. The, the population of California yes, or in the area? Yes, California. The, if we have phone calls or individuals calling in, we are to provide that assistance regardless of the uh, language request. And we will be looking, at the authority will be looking into providing telephonic interpretation services. Some of the services that are out there provide up to 170 uh, language assistance. Uh, what is the budget for this? How much will we be expending on these services? Uh, the, uh, primarily the uh, language assistance, that is uh, the staff volunteers, that is uh, within the, the, of course, the authorities' uh, resources. The telephone services, that is by phone call and depending on how many minutes are utilized and that, and that can range from anywhere of 75 cents a minute up to a higher amount depending Do on the services. Do we have a, a line item in the budget for this? Um, I cannot you know, say at this point what the line item is on that is being proposed for the current, fit in the next fiscal year. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you have any enlightenment on that? Yeah. I, I don't know if we have any particular line item for this. I mean, it would be in our general administrative uh, costs. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see that broken out. Sure. Okay. Uh, when we get to it, and, and 
pretty specifically about sure. what we're what right. we're spending okay. uh, on that. And then um, I would like to have, uh, as we progress over the years here, uh, some more uh, discussion. Uh, my my concerns. And again, you know, I, I know how difficult it is not to speak English, uh, uh, but my concern for the safety and the welfare of the people affected by this project where limited English or no English can affect in translation what happens. Uh, so I would like us to make sure that not only are we providing the translation service, but that we're also focusing on uh, the, the who, where, they're, where they are uh, involved in the project, and uh, reports back on uh, the, the connection between, for example, some construction or subcontractor uh, who doesn't speak English, who speaks some other language, and how they fit into the overall uh, construction or whatever area that they're involved with. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments uh, of staff? Uh, seeing none, what is before us is the staff request for resolution uh, HSRA number 12-15. What's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Uh, motion by um, Director Umber. Is there a second? Second. Director Burns, uh, please call the roll, uh, Ms. Tu. Vice Chair Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Mr. Umberg? Aye. Mr. Burns? Yes. Mr. Hartnett? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fonseca. We'll now move on to uh, we'll now move on to item number 12. So if you'll stay with us, and this is the to adopt and approve the uh, excuse me to update an amendment on Title uh, Six plan. This is an informational item and no action of the board is required at this time. At the March 1st the board meeting, the board approved the Title VI program plan with an amendment. The background for the amendment is that Title VI program states that a report of accomplishments and activities will be submitted to the Federal Railroad Administration on a triannual basis per their directive. Chairman Richard requested an amendment to the Title VI program plan requiring a yearly or more often as determined by the board, accomplishment and activities report to be submitted to the board finance and audit committee. The Title VI has, has been modified to read as the Title VI coroner shall, uh, shall compile an annual report or more often as determined by the board on the authority's Title VI activities that reflect Title VI program compliance and accomplishments. The report will be submitted to the authority's finance and audit committee. Upon request, the report will be transmitted to the FRA. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Monseco. Uh, before you leave, do any of the members have uh, any questions for staff? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move back up in the agenda now to item number eight. Uh, item number eight is Supplemental Alternative Analysis Report for Palmdale. Mr. McLaughlin. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the board. I'm Mark McLaughlin, uh, Interim Deputy Director of Environmental Planning. John Hurley, John Hawley, excuse me, is the Engineering Manager for the Palmdale LA Regional consul Consultant Team. Hatchmont McDonald, Arup, and URS, who will be giving your presentation today. The last time this team presented this uh, item at a board meeting was when they presented the supplemental AA for the Somar to LA section in March of 2011. This is an action item before you today. Good morning. Good morning, Vice Chair, board members. Um, so this presentation covers the supplemental alternative analysis for the subsection of the Palmdale to Los Angeles section <coughs> between Palmdale and the San Fernando Valley, referred to as between Palmdale and Silmar. Um, I think you're probably challenged in seeing the slides, but um, the picture that's up on the screen shows the Palmdale to Los Angeles section. It's about 62 miles in length and traverses uh, mountains between Palmdale and the San Fernando Valley and then a dense um, urban suburban area from the north end of the San Fernando Valley um, all the way into Los Angeles Union Station. In the 2005 program environmental document, this section included two broad study areas that did not include specific alignments. The two study areas 
uh, shown on, by the yellow circles on the slide, um, which are the mountain um, section. Um, and in addition, um, the area local to LA Union Station. Um, and additional alignment studies were um, performed in those two areas. In between those two areas, the alignment follows the existing um, Metro-owned, Metrolink and Union Pacific um, tracks um, through the San Fernando Valley. So the purpose of this presentation and the supplemental AA record is to present for board review and approval the alternatives in the mountain section. Uh, as mentioned, um, there was a previous preliminary alternatives analysis report which identified the um, broad alternative alignments between Palmdale and Los Angeles, and that was approved by the board in July 2010. And then the supplemental AA report in March of 2011 um, refined the alignment al alternatives near downtown Los Angeles and in the San Fernando Valley. But at that board meeting, um, the consideration of the Palmdale to Silmar subsection was deferred to a later date, and that's what we're here to present today. So based on the supplemental um, alternative analysis of March 2011, there are um, a number of recommended alignment options, and as we click our way through the slides, um, we'll show how we're going to review those. We're going to break the mountain section down into even smaller sections where we have different alternatives. In Palmdale itself, um, in the Acton Aquadulce area, um, between Acton and Santa Clarita, actually in the Santa Clarita and San Canyon area, and then from Santa Clarita through to the San Fernando Valley at Silmar. Um, Click on four. Keep going. Right. Um, for the audience, you can see the picture. This slide shows Palmdale. In the bigger, you can see the different um, land uses. The big red blob towards the top right is Palmdale Airport and the defence contractors. Um, you can see the commercial and built-up areas, um, and you can also see the alignments. Um, and just to point out what the colour coding on the alignments means, green is at grade or on low fill or shallow cut, blue is on viaduct, the amber yellow colour is in trench, and purple down at the bottom of the slide is tunnel. Consistent with the preliminary AA, we are proposing two alignments into Palmdale, um, one on the east and one on the west. The east alignment um, enters Palmdale at grade across the San Andreas Fault and then along the existing Metro UPR rail corridor with a proposed stop at the existing Palmdale um, Transportation Centre. Whereas the west alignment um, enters further west through currently undeveloped areas through threading its way through Palmdale and then joins the um, Metro UP rail alignment north of Palmdale Airport. And that would mean the station location would not be at the existing um, transportation centre would be about a mile north and west. Moving on south into the Acton Aquadulce area, um, the, the supplemental AA from last year had two alternative alignments, the east and west alignments, mostly in tunnel, but um, coming um, to the surface in different areas of the Acton area. Um, during the preliminary uh, review... I'm sorry to interrupt, but yep. we're having, or at least I'm having difficulty here. We can't see that. We do have slides here. Could you reference okay. the figure number yeah. that uh, you're discussing so we can do follow more carefully? Print, do you actually have a printout of the presentation there? We're on slide number 11. Or are you actually referring to the report itself? Uh, well, the report. In the report, in the report, please. We've got figure 1.6-1, for example. I think what I'll do then is lead you through the um, report. And um, tell us, just tell us which page you're going to start with. 
So, I, yes, I'll start on um, page, um, let me see what's the best place to start, is page um, 7 of the report, where you see the subsections that we're discussing Good. on figure 1.143. Yeah, I was afraid, I was afraid the um, slideshow was going to be rather challenging. Um, so turning the page, looking at the Santa Clarita um, substate section and the options considered in Sand Canyon, and I'm afraid the slides are now going to be out of sync with this because they're in a different order. Um, but in figure 151, you can see that there were a number of alternatives suggested um, by stakeholders as a result of our out out outreach meetings. Um, one um, suggested was um, moving out of the residential area and closely following the, um, the Santa, um, Santa Clara River and try to stay within the river as much as possible. Um, a second alternative was to very closely follow the existing Metrolink um, and a third was to very closely follow the existing freeway, State Route 14. The um, State Route 14 option would have slowed the alignment down um, to about 70 miles an hour, which does not mean, does not meet the purpose and need of the high speed rail. And would also, of course, have caused extensive reconstruction of the freeway at um, additional expense. So this um, option was not um, carried forward for further consideration. Um, closely following the uh, Metrolink right of way would also have very, very seriously slowed down the alignment, also to speeds so of, depending on how closely you follow it, between 40 and 70 miles an hour. So again, that does not meet. Um, purpose and need. Um, a fourth suggestion was to extend the tunnel. At this stage of the study, we are only um, putting the um, alignment into tunnel where it is forced upon us by um, topographic reasons or where there's a, a, a clear case for doing so. We're not um, really considering tunnels as purely as a mitigation measure. And there's no topographic or other physical re reason why this length of alignment um, should be in tunnel. Um, we studied um, in a bit more detail the alignment following the Santa Clara River, and this had a number of issues. Um, for one thing, to um, achieve the speeds required, um, we actually have more residential impacts um, following the river because to achieve a speed of um, 220 miles an hour, which is our, um, which is our goal, um, we can't follow the river exactly, and there are significant residential impacts. There are also very significant environmental impacts um, follow, following the river channel, and there are also issues with if the tunnel emerges in the river channel, there are risks of flooding to the project, but there's also obstruction to the channel, which could cause flooding elsewhere upstream of um, our alignment. Um, but what we did do, and if you look at um, figure 1.5.2 on page 9, um, and we include in the um, appendices to the report the evaluation of three alternatives, following the river and, and a slight adjustment to our preliminary AA alignment, which slows us down, um, delays um, trains by about 15 seconds, but ha does have less um, residential impact and also avoids a church, which the preliminary AA alignment did impact. It does bring us slightly closer to Sulphur Springs School, but we don't actually impact the school property. As a result of the evaluation, we're recommending that the two alignments, the um, Metrolink 200 option and the previous preliminary AA alignment, are carried forward into the environmental document. Moving on to page 11, looking at alternative alignments through the Acton area. Um, first of all, um, at the, near the bottom of that figure, the um, SR14 East alignment you can see passes close to two schools. 
since we did the original, um, that original alignment, as a result of outreach, um, we discovered that the school had obtained additional property and extended the property um, so that we were crossing the school property and um, we were within about uh, 400 feet of the proposed new school buildings and the proposal to rebuild Vasquez High School. Um, as a result of that outreach, we have now moved the alignment um, further south so it's clear of the school property, which I'll show on, which you can see on the um, figure on the next page. There were other suggestions made um, during the outreach process. One, again, was to um, lower the alignment and just um, cross this valley in a tunnel, which would have meant pushing the alignment down, would have created a tunnel with an overall length of about 11 miles, which has um, fairly, some fairly significant <coughs> operational safety, cost, and other, other considerations, and again, is, um, is not required by the topography. There was a suggestion to closely follow the State Route 14, running the median of the freeway, um, this would slow the alignment down to about 70 miles an hour so it does not meet the um, project goals and also would um, force considerable construction of the state route. And in addition, the, um, the space within the median is already identified by Caltrans for future freeway widening. And there was a, a third suggestion which was to um, start off on the SR14 west alignment and join that onto the SR14 East alignment. The reason for that being that the residents of Acton actually preferred the SR14 West alignment but were are aware that the city of Palmdale prefers the East alignment so they felt that um, an alignment which connected both um, West to East would be the best of both worlds. And so we developed an alignment which did that. It does, again, have a speed and journey time penalty of about 20 seconds, um, but we can maintain speeds of um, over 180 miles an hour, and we can avoid the what's regarded perhaps as the, as the downtown area of Acton. And so we are proposing that this additional hybrid alignment is carried forward into the environmental document. So in summary, we are recommending that we um, adjust the alignments previously identified in the preliminary AA. So in the Santa Clarita area, we carry forward the preliminary AA alternative as it was, plus this um, additional alternative which follows, the, follows Metrolink more closely but it still does not follow Metrolink exactly. There's a slight reduction in residential impacts. It doesn't impact um, the church. It, um, uh, it actually does um, miss the um, Vista Canyon development which was um, mentioned earlier and it only has a very slight um, 15 second or so um, journey time penalty. And then um, in the Acton Palmdale area we are proposing that we add this additional hybrid option which um, goes through Acton on the preferred um, SR14 West um, alignment but then connects to the um, SR14 East alignment through the existing transportation centre in Palmdale. Okay. I'll be, I'll be glad to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for staff or comments? Uh, seeing none, we have before us uh, Resolution HSR A 12-16, Palmdale to Los Angeles sup Supplemental Analysis, Alternatives Analysis. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Will we adopt the resolution? Uh, a motion by Director Hartnett. Is there a second? By Director Umberg. I just comment just briefly. Um, in the, the written reports we received were very detailed uh, and uh, very helpful to understand the background of the alternatives and, and why the recommendations were made. Um, and uh, you know, the, the verbal report was uh, kind of summarizing and supplementing, but I, I just wanted to be clear that, that I, I thought the, the, the written reports were, were 
really very helpful to the background understanding of this. And I want to thank you for all the work that went into that. Thank you, Director Hardnett. I also wanted to say something similar, and that is uh, it's very difficult because of the um, of the technology that we've got before us here, but um, it's difficult to follow it. But we have, in fact, uh, had very extensive information to review in the last uh, week and a half or so, uh, which makes it much more easily uh, followed. Had it been uh, having to look at it uh, the way you've just seen it, it would have been very difficult for us to have acted today. So we have a motion in a second. Uh, uh, please call the roll. Vice Chair Schenck? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Mr. Umberg? Yes. Mr. Burns? Yes. Mr. Hartnett? Yes. Thank you very much. We're going to, uh, just as a um, comment to uh, my colleagues, uh, there is no report uh, for item number seven, so we'll not uh, have agenda item seven today, and we'll ask staff to uh, place it on a future uh, meeting date uh, when appropriate. We'll now move uh, to our scheduled, uh, well, let me do this. We're slightly ahead of that, but we do have another comment from the public. So we'll go back to comments from the public. And we have uh, Mr. Oliveira. Mr. Oliveira, I thought I saw him earlier. Oh, OK, there he is. Sorry, uh, sorry, Frank. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I, you may want to just announce again the. Uh, I shall. Uh, the meeting at 10 o'clock. And, and put it in any cards by, by yeah. 10 for okay. their speaking. Okay. Thank you. I'll do that. Frank, if you'll just uh, one moment. The uh, hearing that we've got scheduled at uh, 10 o'clock is the hearing for uh, item number 10 on the agenda, which is consideration of a resolution to certify Merced to Fresno Section EIREIS. So I'm going to ask and encourage anybody who would like to address us uh, with public comments to please ensure that your green uh, slips have been or will be given to the secretary as soon as possible. We're going to close those comment cards uh, at 10 o'clock. So please go ahead, Mr. Oliveira. Welcome. Thank you. Frank Oliveira I'm with the Citizens for California High Speed Rail Accountability. In the past, uh, we've approached this board pretty solidly for a year and expressed that there were problems with the process. I was not at the meeting here yesterday, but reading through the comments, some of the information that's available, it appears that in the section that you're addressing, the, e the EIR today, that there were people who were acknowledging or advising you that things were misidentified, mis misevaluated, things were not done correctly, which is consistent with the things that we've brought up over a year, the past year. All of that said, I realize you're going to certify the EIR today for this section. My request is simple. Since there are many questions pertaining to the legality of Prop 1A funds being used to proceed forward, because the board does not have the funds available to complete the IOS. My request is simple. Do not buy any right away until those matters are resolved, because it will do immense harm to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oliveira. Uh, do we have any other uh, members in the audience who would like to uh, address uh, comments to the board? Uh, seeing none, we will now close the uh, public comment portion of the meeting, and we will take up the uh, agenda items at agenda item number nine, Mr. McLaughlin. Good morning again, Mr. Vice Chair and Board. <clears throat> at the request of the Board yesterday, staff has addressed in writing issues raised during our meeting from the public and the Board and those raised also in letters. Staff's written response has been provided to you and the public today. Now, if you have this document. Yes. yes. Does everybody have this? Yes. This is available outside in the hallway, and it's also being uploaded currently on our website, on the authority's website. Could, could you speak a little closer to the microphone? Sure. 
Better? Yes. These cop excuse me. During the preparation of this summary yesterday and last night, staff has not found any items that would preclude the board from considering the resolution to certify the Merced de Fresno final EIRS, EIR EIS today. For questions that you may have, we have technical staff available to you to answer any questions that you may have. In addition to that, we've heard from the Forcia family this morning. I would like to engage with them and meet with them to address their issues. Um, we would like to present that to the board that the staff will follow through with that, that item. So we have technical staff here. If there's any questions, I know you've had a short period of time to, to review this summer. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, and thanks to the staff uh, who I know worked late into the night and perhaps the early morning hours to give us the answers uh, to comments and questions that we had raised to you yesterday. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments uh, of uh, Mr. McLaughlin? Yes, Mr. Hardin. Uh, thank you. When uh, when we reconvened in, in the in the afternoon after having heard the public comments uh, yesterday, um, we had the opportunity to raise questions with staff that we wanted to make sure were answered uh, today. Um, and um, I, I think in the, your written uh, report that includes uh, answers to uh, lots of questions, uh, I think you did address the, the, the questions that, that we, we asked, and I'm thankful for that. Um, there were over, uh, were, by my count, as I said yesterday, there were about 50 people who uh, uh, spoke at the uh, public portion of the session yesterday. Uh, some of whom raised uh, issues, but we also received uh, correspondence, as was indicated earlier uh, today, uh, including uh, letters from a number of attorneys representing various clients. And I, in, in reviewing the attorneys' letters, um, frankly, they were overlapping in, in a large, you know, in, in large respect in terms of the issues that they raised. So, what, what I have found in your uh, response. Uh, that uh, it appears to me that you, you have uh, been able to identify the common subject areas, even though there were multiple letters, and, and address the issues um, pretty straightforwardly that were raised. So I thank you for that. I, uh, it, it, it seemed because of the number of letters from attorneys that there were more issues raised than there really were. I think when you boil them down, that there, there's a lot of commonality. But one of the um, ones that I wasn't totally clear on that I'd like a little more explanation is, is in the uh, Perkins, Mann, and Everett letter. Um, uh, there was a, a discussion about um, a failure to include the analysis of the I-5 corridor uh, in the manner that they uh, thought uh, should have been. Could, could you address, could someone address that a little bit? I want sure. to make sure that's clear. Sure. Uh, uh, John Popoff of the PMT will address that issue. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm, my name is John Popoff. I'm the uh, Deputy Program Director for the PMT. We had uh, comments yesterday regarding uh, the new technology on the AGV. Well, oh, this this uh, question is on the I-5 corridor, uh, is what I was asking about, not the new well, technology. The I if I'm, okay, the I-5 corridor is, my understanding on the I-5 corridor was part of the programmatic, uh, where the um, decision was made to the board to consider, um, a commitment was made to go through the uh, urban areas, to connect the urban areas of the state of California. I-5 does not do that. The technology proposed yesterday, if I understand correctly, was saying that the new technology of the AGV would make the I-5 viable. Oh, okay. No, I understand why you're making the link now. Thank you. Uh, that is my understanding of the question yesterday raised by one of the commenters. 
The, I, the AGV is not new technology. It was considered by the board in its original decision with the um, I-5 corridor versus the connectivity. The AGV is a product that is currently produced by the uh, company called Alstom. The same technology is produced in a very highly competitive market by a large number of manufacturers, including the, the Germans, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese. And we do not preclude or favor the use of any of these manufacturers. They're all in a very competitive market. And the, the use of the AGV, as I say, is not new technology. It's technology that is just based on a single manufacturer that is very competitive with, with all the other manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardnett. Yeah, yes, Mr. Umberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Concern raised by uh, several of the board members was with respect to notification. And um, I'm heartened to see what we've done with respect to notification. It appears that we've utilized all, all three methods that are prescribed in the law. Um, I, I think it's also the sense of the board, though, that, that we do, we continue to do whatever we can with respect to notification, that we uh, go beyond what the law requires, as you've done here, and, and continue with the most expansive and in-depth notifications we possibly can. So uh, thank you for your report. It looks like that's what we're doing. Uh, second comment is with respect to the I-5 quarter. If we could post on our website uh, as one of the frequently asked questions is why the I-5 quarter doesn't work, that would be helpful because I think we get asked that question often. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, uh, Vice Chair Shane. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one of my big concerns also is notification, and I, I know that with um, limitations and, and time that uh, – Sometimes it's difficult, but this is the biggest project you know, in our state, and it'll affect a lot of small businesses and, and uh, homeowners, who, uh, particularly small business people, who you know they're busy making a living. They're, they're working 12, 15-hour days, and uh, you know maybe they don't have time to read the local newspaper as thoroughly uh, as possible or, or listen to local news if it's on. So uh, if, if there is some way in uh, maybe talking to the small business uh, groups that are in existence to get their advice on what is a practical way to contact small business owners. Uh, you know, we, we all get so much junk mail. I know I stand at my <laughs> mailbox and just sort of throw stuff away if it looks like it's junk mail. and. Maybe a, a notification such as ours doesn't look like personal mail. So we could figure out some way to effectively and practically and in a common sense way communicate with, with folks who are going to be impacted. Uh, the second is uh, I was glad to hear that uh, you, you heard the uh, Forestier family, again, because that's of concern to me and I would like to hear back uh, from you, and I, I say I'm, I appreciate your hearing what they had to say as well. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Schenck. Uh, any other comments from the board? Uh, I would only echo uh, what the Vice Chair just mentioned, and I was pleased to hear you say, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, your intention to read out, reach out to the first year family. Uh, one other, um, not that any of the 50 comments that we heard yesterday or so uh, didn't strike me in one way or another, but I would certainly appreciate whoever the appropriate staff might be to also uh, reach out to um, uh, Ms. Rose Martinez. And sp her business uh, is the International Immigration Service. It would seem to me that there's a way that we can uh, find, a, find the means to find solutions for her. Agreed. All right. Thank you. If there are no other comments uh, from the board on item number nine, thank you, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, very much. Thank you. We're going to – we do have two other comment cards that uh, did just come in before 10 o'clock, so we will hear both of those now. Uh, the first is from Andrea Radonabaugh. 
I hope I'm not saying that correctly, and I apologize, but it's you did it much easier for me. It's Radaba. Yes. I apologize. Anya Radaba. Thank you. Very German. Thank you very much. And thank you for hearing another subsection of comments. I didn't realize that we had that opportunity. So I apologize. I may not be as eloquently spoken as I was yesterday. Um, and I am going through the staff's response to comments on a variety of things yesterday. And uh, of course, you're going to get some similarity and some overlapping comments because summarily we similarly don't feel that we're being consistently answered. Um, and I see that the staff has made an, an honest attempt at answering some of the, uh, what we felt were uh, lacking with respect to ag mitigation measures. Um, so I had some questions. It, I, don't, I don't know if you wanted to consider that, but uh, essentially staff is stating that the authority will fund the California Farmland Conservation Program to implement the preservation of farmland. And it would be really helpful for those of us on the ag side to know in what amount, because ag conservation easements are based on a highly speculative practice of funding. And um, the other contention that I have with that is that that funding is based on willing sellers. And what happens if you don't have willing sellers is a big question in Madera County, because I, I know today that you will not have 100% willing sellers along the alignment. So those are some questions that I had. Um, with respect to those mitigation measures uh, specific to the loss of ag land, if the board could also ensure that ag experts are consulted, specifically the California Farm Bureau, on whether or not they concur that that's actually going to be a one-to-one -one loss, because this is new information. So th that concludes my, my comments. Thank you, Mr. Adubo. Our final comment today is uh, from Ms. Martinez. Welcome back. Roseanne Martinez. Can you pull that? Thank you. You know my name, Roseanne Martinez, with International Immigration Service. I believe, I feel like I don't count. I'm a businesswoman. Is it any, is it possible that you can pull I the, feel thank you. today, when I heard this news about my, my office being closed down, like I don't count. Like I lived a life that doesn't count. You can't just wipe my life away like that. It's not right. I think your engineers need to spend more time in seeing who families as well as businesses you're displacing. I just want you to know that, each one of you on this board. Thank you. Thank you. We have no more comment cards, and uh, I'm just going to ask very quickly is, is, to the comments you just recently heard then, Mr. McLaughlin, would there be anything that sca staff feels it needs to address to us in response? Um, I do not. Um, I think we've made a pretty thorough summary for you. Um, again, Ms. Martinez and Ms. the Forstier family. We would like to meet with them again and reach out to them, as you suggested, and we will do that and take Thank their you. advice on working with our engineers. Um, we can also work with the Ag Group as far as what our program is for the Department of Conservation and our Ag mitigation. We can meet with them and discuss how we're approaching that, we're trying to uh, move forward with properties of high, the highest agricultural value that we can provide. All right, thank you. Do any uh, members have any questions for Mr. McLaughlin? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to move on to agenda item number 10, the 10 o'clock uh, noticed item, which is consideration of a resolution to certify Merced de Fresno section EIR, our final EIR, EIS. Good morning, uh, Mr. Richards, uh, members of the board, and Mr. Falenz. Um, my name is Danae Aitchison. I'm with the California Attorney General's Office, and we are assisting your staff in the environmental process. On agenda item 10, there are no slides today. Um, agenda item 10 provides the board with an opportunity to consider taking action on the two draft resolutions in your board book. I just want to clarify that there are two. There is draft resolution 12-19 
and draft resolution 12-20. Uh, these two resolutions, should the board choose to adopt them, would do a number of things, and I want to just take a minute to walk you through that. Um, but I want to just emphasize that staff this morning has presented you with a slightly revised version of resolution 12-20. It's before you. Copies were provided to the public outside on the, the front uh, desk. That is intentionally done as a red line so you can see those minor changes. Um, what they do is they make an adjustment to one of the air quality mitigation measures. It is accompanied by a one-page revision to the findings. And it looks like uh, maybe I should pause there and confirm you have what you need in front of you. Um, Yes, it appears uh, Member Umberg has found it. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and, and again, there are copies out on the uh, front table for any who wish to, to see that. Um, let me begin by talking about Resolution 12-19. This particular resolution is intended to provide certification of the final program EIR EIS for compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Now, the, the board has been through this process quite recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I want to just go over the, the basics here. In taking this step, the board is going to be making three very critical certifications. Um, first, that the document has been completed in compliance with CEQA. Second, that the document that's before you and, and shown here on the table and all of the other pieces of paper um, have been presented to the board members, uh, reviewed by them, and considered prior to taking any action today. And third, that the EIR reflects the board's independent judgment. So I want to touch on those just very quickly so you have the information that you need before making decisions. Um, on the first certification, the board is being asked to certify the document for compliance with CEQA. And I just want to clarify that, you know, you may, you may question, well, how do I know how to do that? Um, you know, the question isn't, do you have a perfect environmental analysis here before you? That is not the standard. The standard is whether or not the EIR is functioning as a sufficient information document for your decision-making purposes and to disclose to the public the environmental impacts of this project reasonable and feasible mitigation measures to address those impacts and a reasonable range of alternatives. Um, the staff recommendation before you is the document uh, is sufficient in that respect. On the second certification, the board has been provided with its board book materials um, the entire EIR. Um, just for clarity and, and to recall, the board was provided the EIR document in a couple of different ways. Um, some of the pieces were provided in hard copy. You also received a disk with everything. And uh, those were in your board book memo. Um, you received hard copies of an errata. And you also received hard copies of a, a very short document called an addendum. Um, let me just touch on that addendum document. Um, that was intended to provide the board with additional information as well as the public um, to uh, better explain how the EIR um, is synergistic with some of the concepts in the recently adopted business plan. Um, the, the third certification regarding independent judgment. Um, the board is going to certify that this document is embraced by you and reflects your independent judgment. Um, this is not a, a rubber stamping of the staff recommendation. The board's duty here is to take a look at all of the information before you the materials you see today, the, mis the, the public comment that you heard yesterday and today, uh, and to look at the whole of the record and make a determination. Um, it, just uh, confirming again, you know, this isn't a, a process where you defer to staff. Uh, this is your decision to make. So if the board chooses to approve Resolution 12-19, you would then move to 12-20. And I'm going to just take a minute to explain in a little bit more detail what that resolution would do, because that is your functional approval resolution for this project. As part of that resolution, you would be adopting what are called CEQA findings of fact. Um, these are required by law. They briefly describe the project that's before you today for approval. They go through the impacts and identify all of the mitigation measures that bring some of those impacts to a less than significant level and others that remain significant, even if you adopt all of those mitigations. 
That resolution would also adopt a very critical document called a Statement of Overriding Considerations. It's also required by law. The board is required to explain to the public why the benefits of this project outweigh those significant environmental impacts that remain even with implementation of all feasible mitigation measures. Another document that would be adopted by this resolution is called a Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program that was touched on yesterday. This is a legal mechanism by which the authority is committing to implement all of the mitigation measures listed there. And then finally, the project approval. Um, I want to be very clear because I think that there was some confusion with the, the, the board asked a question yesterday or was concerned about confusion over the subject of today's approval. Um, this is a complex project. It has a complex EIR with a lot of information in it. Um, but the EIR has described consistently that there's a lot of analysis there, but the approval for today would be uh, limited to the north-south uh, hybrid alignment in the areas outside what we refer to as the rectangular box. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide, but you have before you in all of your materials um, a depiction of that alignment with a rectangle. Now, the purpose of that rectangle uh, is not to indicate uh, that, that you're disavowing or, or not embracing anything inside that box. It's, it's part of the project that's studied in the EIR, but not up for approval today. The staff recommendation and what is before you in Resolution 12-20 is that you would approve the north-south alignment outside of that box and carry forward all of the potential alignments inside that box that are depicted on the map for additional environmental review, uh, potential refinements and additional environmental review. Um, the purpose of that was to allow additional alternatives to be considered rather than moving forward with just two of those east, west, and y connections. Um, I'd also just like to note here that the heavy maintenance facility is studied. Five alternatives were studied in the EIR. The staff is not putting a heavy maintenance facility site selection forward for you today. So just to summarize, the resolution would have you make a decision regarding the hybrid alternative north and south outside of that rectangular box, a station location in downtown Merced, a station location in downtown Fresno, and carrying forward all of that material with the east-west connections and Ys for further environmental review and consideration and a decision at a later date. Um, the final point on the resolution that's before you is that it also includes next steps. Um, and those next steps are intended to clarify that the Y areas would be the subject of that additional uh, evaluation. Um, and that you would direct the staff to take the steps necessary to move the approved part of this project forward for implementation. So um, that concludes my presentation on the decisions before you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Hatchison. Uh, colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Chank, uh, any questions? Well, I'll defer to. Okay. Uh, thank you. First, uh, appreciate the, your uh, verbal summary of uh, the action uh, that we're being requested to, to take in the context of it. Um, uh, I. Uh, Appreciate all the work that's been put into the documents and, and the resolutions. Uh, the uh, I feel comfortable uh, with the ability to adopt both 1219 and 1220 based upon uh, independent review of, of the materials, uh, independent judgment being exercised on on that. As I have said uh, in previous meetings, I've had the opportunity over the years to. Um, review a number of uh, complex environmental impact reports and um, I find the the, uh, the quality of the work in in, uh, in these documents that we've been pre uh, presented uh, to be of the highest nature um, and, and up to the standards that uh, uh, I've found uh, to be uh, acceptable uh, in other reports that I've looked at and, and I know it's, uh, uh, there's always issues that arise in every report that I've reviewed. There's always things that uh, 
need to be changed at uh, one point or another uh, or assessed uh, as to whether or not it needs to be changed. And uh, I find that uh, uh, the, the concerns that have been raised were adequately addressed uh, in uh, the documents and in the responses that, that, uh, that you provided uh, in writing and, and verbally. So I appreciate the work. Um, uh, but I'm not relying upon your opinion for uh, making my decision on this. I rely on my experience and having reviewed these kinds of reports and, and actually reviewing these, and, and I, I find them to, to meet the required standards. Thank you, Director Hartnett. Vice Chair Schenken. Thank you, and uh, I echo what uh, my colleague has said. This is, uh, I too, over the past 30 years, have read more environmental documents than I care to remember. And uh, this is a, a extraordinarily complex project. Uh, we've read the material, uh, the material that we have before you here, uh, listened to the, the comments that were made in public, read every letter, every email that was uh, forwarded to to us as authority members and uh, uh, certainly reflected through the, the night and this morning on the comments that were, were made yesterday and I think that in uh, the authority board members' responses to staff, I think that uh, that consideration was reflected and uh, this is uh, truly historic. Uh, for me, 30 years in the makings uh, since first uh, talking about high-speed rail. Uh, I was um, very heartened to see the, the young people from our train and look forward to their continued participation because this really is now about them. Uh, getting back to the environmental documents, uh, I mean, obviously we haven't been able to mitigate every single impact that is either seen as negative or truly is negative. But in looking at the overall dramatic benefit to this area and to the state, I think that this environmental uh, impact reports and statements are as thorough uh, in addressing the issues as any that I have, have ever seen. And um, although it's not San Diego to Los Angeles, <laughs> my colleagues are getting tired of hearing about, but I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, in, in that spirit of, of compromise, uh, I uh, feel very comfortable in supporting this uh, based on, as I say, all the independent review that, that I have done over these weeks and months. And uh, thank you. Uh, specifically and the rest of the staff for the tremendous amount of work and responsiveness to our questions and concerns. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick comments also, uh, certainly echoing what the Vice Chair just said, but uh, I personally appreciate very much uh, your assistance, uh, the myriad questions that I ask, um, not understanding a lot of the legal issues. Uh, but you've certainly helped clarify things for me, and the work that the staff has done is truly amazing. Um, for the public, we, we certainly appreciate those who are supportive of this project, but I will say that we appreciate as well and equally those who um, are critical of the project, because it may seem for, to you from time to time, or maybe always, that, that, you're not, that we're not listening. Um, I don't think that's the case. Clearly what I think is, is your input has, is, and will continue to make this project better and this system more responsive to the uh, needs of future generations in California. And it is a historic day because I think for, this brings us closer, uh, not only in the entire northern hemisphere, well, perhaps that's unfair, but nor North America, uh, the United States, California, and here in the local valley, the Central Valley of California, which, um, as everybody up here knows, I'm very proud to be a resident of, um, to
to have this start here uh, is a great honor and is the basis on which this great system will be looked back on to this action today and what we'll do in the next year as being a true beginning in bringing transportation to our citizens into the 21st century in California. That being said, uh, we have two resolutions before us. The first resolution is HSRA 1219, the certification of the Merced de Fresno section of the final environmental impact report, in environmental impact station, or excuse me, statement. So moved. Move approval. Second. Motion by Director Umberg, uh, second by Vice Chair Schenck. Could we call the roll, please? Vice Chair Schenck? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Mr. Umberg? Yes. Mr. Burns? Yes. Mr. Hartnett? Yes. The second uh, motion before us today is, uh, as has been noted by Council, has been amended since what was placed in your package, but it's HSRA Resolution Number 12-20. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, and including the attachment page A1 with the revised mitigation measure. Thank you. Including the attachments A1 is the revised mitigation measure, uh, measures. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, again, this uh, this proposal is responsive to the concerns that uh, many of us had about the the why alternative. It is confusing to many, and uh, you really laid it out very very well. I, I would just like to perhaps add, uh, actually, based on uh, Mr. Burns's uh, suggestion, that we have a a date by which this recommendation would come back so that uh, staff shall return to the board with recommendations by, say, July 1 or July 31. Would, would that work? I, I think that what we're going to have here, I think first uh, we've got the motion, um, which doesn't, uh, I don't think that provides for that. So No, but that's, I want to amend the okay. motion. Okay, fine. Before we make it. All right. Uh, are we able to do this? I'm, I'm going to rely on Mr. Falenz on the rules okay. of order here for amending. Uh, yes, you, you can uh, make, make your motion with an amendment. With the amendment. Yes. Right. That's, that's what I was trying to do. But I, wanted, uh, I, I don't want to be unrealistic in terms of a, a return date. Uh, so uh, July 31? Um, if, if I just may let, clarify, let, the goal is to have the staff come back to the board and report on progress on the, the, the y. y area. Yes. Um, certainly that can be added at the end of the resolution with an appropriate date. I, um, Mark I, is... J July 31st for the report back. Is, is that a board meeting date? <laughs> yeah. I'd like or, to or, maybe help clarify something. Okay. I think that what we're... Maybe what we need to do is to ask for the insertion of some uh, additional information okay. in this motion. So basically what you see before you, uh, colleagues, is the amendment, uh, amended uh, document that has been presented to us. What I would like to propose to, uh, to, the, to uh, my uh, colleagues is the following, and that is that with regards to Section 6, the next steps, that we remove what is noted in the document that's been presented and with your permission insert the following. Section 6, next steps, would, is if I can read this into the uh, record, uh, parens A, parens, the authority hereby directs staff to file a notice of determination with the state clearinghouse and to take any and other, are to take any other necessary steps to implement the project. And parens B, parens, staff shall carry forward for further study and analysis all high-speed rail elements in the Y area, um, parens, i.e., comma, the box in quotation shown in figure two of the findings in parens period. Such analysis shall determine whether any of the current Y alternatives should be changed, augmented, or eliminated, or additional Y alternatives considered. 
Staff shall return to the board with recommendations including coverage in further CEQA documentation by this Jan July 31st, 2012. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, Is that that, that's perfect. perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right, with, with that proposal, uh, if the board is so inclined, um, incorporated into this uh, resolution 12-20, uh, what would the uh, board's... Uh, Someone move Someone second. Okay, go ahead. Someone. Okay, Mo motion by uh, Vice Chair Shank, a second by, by, uh, by Director Umber. Uh, please call the roll. Vice Chair Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Mr. Umber? Yes. Mr. Burns? Yes. Mr. Hartnett? Yes. Thank you very, very much. We will now move on to... Um, well done. That's a bit of an afterthought, but very appropriate. Thank you. <laughs> Item number uh, 13 is a blending update, Caltrain. Mr. McLaughlin, thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Albright, I wasn't looking. Greg Albright, the Interim Deputy Director for Planning. I'll be introducing, actually, our Program Management Team's Regional Manager, Dominic Spaling, and he will do the presentation for the blended service. This is clearly one of those key components of our new 2012 business plan. Dominic? Thank you very much. Uh, Dominic Spaithling, Regional Manager. Thanks. Regional Manager, San Francisco to San Jose section. And um, I've been asked just to give you an update on where we are with the blended system and or the blended concepts on the peninsula and tell you what the next steps are. So next slide, please. Just in the way of background, uh, just about a year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, Congresswoman Eshoo, State Senator, Smitty and Assemblymember Gordon released a statement on high-speed rail, which included a concept of blended service. Uh, shortly thereafter, on uh, May 4th in 2011, the High-Speed Rail Board met and uh, the board directed the um, CEO at the time to suspend work on the San Francisco to San Jose section pending clarification. Uh, excuse me, uh, if we could, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, could you ask people who are having private conversations to move it out into the hallway so we can uh, pay sure. attention to our speakers? Sure, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if we could please ask uh, those people who are having conversations in the back, if you could please uh, go out into the lobby, we would appre really appreciate it so the people in here can pay attention to the uh, presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, basically at the May 4th Bay, uh, board meeting in 2011, the board directed the CEO to suspend work on the San Francisco to San Jose section, you know, pending clarification of and further definition of blended service. And uh, really what I'm going to talk about today is what we've been doing since that time um, and really how we've been collaborating with Caltrain and working through what blended operations and a blended system would mean on the peninsula. Next slide, please. Um, just if, by the way of clarification, the uh, graphic on the right is uh, sort of the, a, a graphical representation of the planning process that Caltrain has been leading. And really since uh, about a year ago, Caltrain really took the lead on um, defining a planning process that really defines a vision for the peninsula and really how Caltrain and the high-speed train service could, uh, you know, coexist on the same railroad. Uh, the first sort of row of uh, activities that we have under there really focus on service planning and operational analysis, which I think we can all appreciate is really the discussion and the analysis of how two separate services share the same set of tracks, electrified systems, and all the rest. And so that's where we've been focusing for the last, really for the last year. In addition to that, Caltrain uh, is also evaluating uh, what kind of grade crossing and traffic impacts or, uh, may come as a result of us operating in this shared use corridor. And so they, they have worked that into their scope of work over the next three to six months 
to evaluate these current at grade crossings and to see what grade crossings uh, may be uh, potentially upgraded to um, um, actual grade uh, separations. And then, as always, really important to engage the cities in the corridor, and Caltrain's been really leading that effort. And again, we've been uh, an active participant in that process. Next slide, please. So the real um, emphasis so far has been on the operational study and trying to understand how we can operate together. And Caltrain in March released a uh, report that summarized some of their initial findings. And I'd just like to run through those. First and foremost, that a blended operation is uh, conceptually feasible on the Caltrain corridor. Um, in an electrified system with advanced signal system, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, which is sort of their CBOS, PTC, or positive train control system, can really increase the ability to support future train growth on the corridor. Just by a, sort of a benchmark, they're operating five trains per hour per direction in the peak hour right now. So with that, a blended system without passing tracks, or, or I should say new passing tracks for train overtakes can support up to six Caltrain train and two high-speed trains per hour per direction, or eight trains total. Next slide, please. A blended system with additional passing tracks um, for overtakes can support up to six Caltrain and four high-speed trains per hour per direction, or 10 trains total which is, again, a sort of an increase in capacity. Uh, blended operations results in non-uniform Caltrain headways. I know that's a fairly technical sentence. So what that, sort of, what that means is, is you can imagine the high-speed trains stop very infrequently. They stop at San Jose, maybe Millbrae, and then downtown San Francisco. In order for our trains to do that, the Caltrain trains sort of have to get out of the way, quite frankly, or run up the system and then allow us to come up the corridor. So that means that Caltrain trains sort of have to bunch together and then sort of clear the path so that our trains can come along behind them. And so that, that's what that sentence means, and that's something we're going to work through with Caltrain as to how that effectively carries their passenger loads. And this is a, a fairly obvious statement, but as you can imagine, increasing speeds from 79 to 110 miles an hour decreases the travel times on the corridor. So the faster you go, the shorter the travel times between San Jose and San Francisco and places in between. And so really this first analysis, and this is sort of the conclusion that we have and that we're working from so far, and we have still a lot of work to do, that this, this analysis is really a proof of concept that, that blending can work on the peninsula. Next slide, please. Since um, there's been so much, so many parallel activities, uh, just to highlight uh, the MOU that you know you approved on April 12th uh, where the MTC is sort of the lead agency in the cities of San Francisco and San Jose and the uh, according regional transportation agencies really uh, defines a set of interrelated projects that are consistent with this blended system that uh, we were just sort of talking about which includes a connection to the Transway Transit Center, new high-speed train stations at San Jose and at Millbrae and other core capacity projects. Again, things that we need to define over the next few months, year, to sort of figure out what we really need collectively to have a, a going operation on the peninsula. And finally, an early investment strategy uh, for the Caltrain corridor, which includes the electrification of the line and the implementation of uh, the Caltrain CBOS PTC, or positive train control system. Next slide, please. Finally, just, uh, or I should say, at the last board meeting uh, in April, as part of the uh, partially revised program EIR action, uh, you directed staff to you know, work with the appropriate local governments and transportation agencies to develop a more detailed description of the blended system approach, and then to work on developing a second tier project level EIR for a San Francisco San Jose section that should be fo focused solely on a blended system approach. So we think that's great direction for us to sort of work with Caltrain on what both of those individual tasks mean. And just by way of, and next slide please, thank you. And by, <clears throat> by way of sort of updating you on where we are in overall environmental process on the section, just for, uh, for your information, the Caltrain electrification project, and, and you should know that Caltrain has long envisioned um, 
electrifying its line. And it got pretty far along in the process. And in fact, in 2009, had a finding of no significant impact uh, as part of an environmental assessment under the FTA. Uh, and then I believe it was uh, 2010, uh, the PCJPB board or the Peninsula Community Joint Powers Board considered uh, the, uh, approving the EIR, but then given where we were with the high-speed train project, decided to, to hold off on certifying their document. But they're very close to having a, a fully approved project for the electrification. So that's one element of this overall approach. And then from our side, um, as some of you know, we started our full environmental process in January of 2009, um, but then suspended that in uh, May of, of last year per the board direction. Um, and so really the next step is to meet with Caltrain and to discuss how do we move forward with this blended system concept, how do we environmentally clear it, and what are, what are truly the next steps. So with that, the last step and the next steps. Um, first and foremost, the, uh, the graphic that I pointed to earlier in the presentation, which sort of outlined the multiple steps of Caltrain's planning process. Um, I think it, it's worthwhile for us to, to play that out and to, to be a willing participant in that. It's going to take about a year, but I think it does a, it, the, the process that's been outlined by Caltrain and that we've participated in really helps everybody on the peninsula understand what this, what this system could truly mean for them as far as both operational accessibility, but also, um, you know, the issues with at-grade crossings and potential um, grade separations. All of these answer questions can be answered as part of that process and will give us a better understanding to move forward with as far as the environmental process. And as part of that, if you, if you go back to that slide, you'll see the last box there is sort of coming to some agreement on how we move forward jointly on an environmental process, be it, um, you know, uh, looking at what, how we can use the existing work that Caltrain has done or the existing work the High Speed Rail Authority has done on the corridor or some combination of the two. So finally, you know, we're going to be starting discussions on that over the next uh, weeks, few weeks and months. And uh, the plan is for us to come back to you with something to, to consider and hopefully give us direction on. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Just, uh, Mr. Meister, I, I, I'd only note that uh, it brings back uh, fond memories of my first meeting at, uh, of the board uh, because it was at the May 4th meeting uh, just now a year ago that uh, yeah. was my first meeting, which this issue was uh, uh, addressed in, uh, at some level. So. It's been a fun year. <laughs> and it's gone a long way. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Albright, uh, visual guidelines. Thank you. This is a quick information item, item 14 in your packet there. Um, as is our normal behavior, we wish to be a good neighbor in a community. And so the question is, how do we create a visual fit? And so as we head towards construction in a very a very focused uh, uh, schedule, accelerated process needed to be developed to work the city into influencing how our structures, particularly our major structures, walls and barriers, would visually fit into the context they, they're at. Um, I'm pleased to say that working closely with the city staff, and recognizing once again that this is an accelerated process, uh, we have developed an uh, RFP, a uh, um, request for proposal addendum, that will actually engage the city and our design build con uh, candidates in discussions about visual uh, issues on key focused areas. I, I would like to thank the city because this will be uh, a very accelerated process and they're willing to participate and we've agreed that we would need to consider how to resource them to help us Similar to what we've done in the city of San Jose, for some of you, you've recognized that we've, we've worked with the city of San Jose to build design guidelines. Um, that, that's ahead of the construction project there. Here we're doing it pretty much at the same time, but the city is prepared to assist us uh, with our help. So just coming to the point, I believe that we're going to find ourselves able by engaging all parties, including our very uh, innovative design builders, 
in coming up with context sensitive solutions that will fit, that will keep us on schedule and yet be a complement to the cities. So just to, uh, last point would be that there are a lot of uh, visual issues that are yet uh, unresolved. So it's likely that we'll be coming back to the board to talk about specific solutions, uh, who maintains what, and those sort of things in the future. We're building those at this time. This is the first uh, project on the ground for us, so this is actually building the process that we'll be using in the future. And I might add that as we build, which we built, we're, we're building on the San Jose design guidelines as an example, process-wise. We'll, we'll learn a lot as we go through this particular uh, initial construction uh, portion of our project. And we hope to be then working with cities ahead of construction in the future as we work our way through our initial operating segment and beyond. With that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for the report. Thanks, Greg. On to uh, item number uh, 15, legislative update. Hi, Karen. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, this is just an informational item uh, to update you on the status of various hearing schedules and uh, legislation pending in the legislature. Um, uh, both uh, the budget subcommittees held hearings in mid-April on the Department of Finance's April Finance Letter Appropriation Request, um, which was consistent with the um, board-approved funding plan from, that you approved in November and as well as the uh, remainder of the Prop 1A Connectivity Fund dollars, the $950 million, the remainder of that money that CTC is putting forth for um, those projects. Uh, both committees heard um, the items and we had um, a discussion, but no um, action was taken in either budget, budget subcommittee at that time. Um, there, there is not a follow-up date set yet in the assembly budget subcommittee schedule, uh, though they do have uh, May 2nd and May 9th as possible um, follow-up uh, hearing dates for uh, votes on those items. Uh, full committee um, is expected to be post um, May revise release, which is usually expected mid-May, governor's May revise. And uh, similarly, no hearing date set in the budget sub-2 committee. Um, there are um, a few bills pending in the legislature. Uh, one is um, just recently got amended over uh, an assembly bill uh, 41 by assembly member Hill, which um, just got amended over on the Senate floor. Uh, and that bill enhances uh, disclosure requirements in a manner consistent with recommendations from the Fair Political Practices Com Commission to our bo internal board conflict of interest policies. Uh, the amendment, the bill was just amended to require members of our ridership peer review group to also file statements of economic interest, uh, and that too was um, something that our council had already discussed with the FPVC and we're including in our board, um, our, our high speed rail authorities' internal conflict of interest provisions. Uh, the floor will take that up and then it will come back to the assembly for concurrence, and then we'll be enrolled to the governor. Um, uh, Assemblymember Galgiani uh, recently amended uh, one of her her spot bills uh, to require the authority to consult with the University of California, Cal State University, and, and California Community Colleges um, to look at future workforce needs for um, high-speed rail. Um, we are still analyzing the bill um, for its impacts. We had had a presentation planned for the March board meeting by the Mineta Institutes. Um, who had put forth a proposal on curriculum development. Um, in Assemblymember Galgiani's bill, she's not requesting any funding from Prop 1A, um, but we are still analyzing that bill. And um, she has another bill um, that would have the California Prompt Payment Act apply to the high-speed rail, which um, it, it does apply to us. Um, I, we discussed with the staff. They may be looking at other amendments um, to that bill. Uh, then there are a couple other bills that um, were amended and no longer apply to us. And yesterday, while I was sitting here checking my emails, I found out that um, uh, Senator Dosane just amended 
uh, Bill SB 1117. Um, current, under current law, uh, Caltrans is tasked with producing a statewide rail plan every 10 years. Uh, this bill was amended to have CTC plan, put forth a statewide rail plan with input from the High-Speed Rail Authority and with Caltrans. Um, so we will obviously be looking carefully at that proposal. Uh, the other two bills that um, did not pass out of their house of origin by the policy bill deadline were uh, Assembly Member Harkey's AB 1455 and Senator LaMalfa's SB 985, both of which would have ceased all future appropriations for Prop 1A. Uh, they were they only differed in that um, Harkey's bill would have allowed the connectivity funds to proceed independent of our appropriation. And that's it for now. I'll keep you posted. Do you have any questions? All right. Thank you very much, uh, thank you. Karen. Very appreciate it. Item number uh, 16. Uh, do any members have any reports or anything? Okay, item number 17, the uh, Chief Executive Officer's Report. Tom. Uh, Vice Chair Richards and, and board members. Uh, yesterday, um, I, I and uh, Patricia Jones met with um, County, Fresno County Supervisor Susan Anderson and Henry, Henry Perea um, with some city officials and many county officials. We had our consultants there. And uh, the purpose of the meeting was to coordinate property acquisitions with our local partners. The meeting was very productive. Um, also in attendance was uh, PDC CEO uh, Leanne Edgar. Uh, we're working on a collaborative effort to reach out to property owners. Um, right now we have sent out 50 notices of uh, decision to appraise to property owners along the alignment. And those were mailed out on April 17th. Uh, there's approximately 600 uh, properties within Fresno and, uh, I mean, Fresno County and the city of Fresno. So it's important for us to work uh, very closely with our, our local partners. Uh, tomorrow, um, myself and uh, Jeff Abercrombie, John Popup are going down to uh, Kings County uh, to meet with them and discuss with them some requests of uh, or some answers to questions that they had posed uh, some time ago and that we recently answered. There was about 65 questions that they had related to impacts to their county. And so we're meeting with them personally tomorrow to um, go over those questions and see if we can uh, answer any additional questions that they might have. On um, May 17th in Bakersfield, there's a high-speed rail small business outreach event with the five design build proposal teams. Small businesses are encouraged to attend to discuss business opportunities that will be available as a result of construction package number one from uh, north of Merced through the city of Fresno. Um, I met with legislative council this week to provide information so they can answer um, Senator Simidian's question posed to him, which is uh, whether the high-speed rail business plan, the revised plan, is compliant with Prop 1A. It was a very um, good discussion. He's very knowledgeable about the proposition, and uh, he's going to answer that question for the senator. On April 23rd, I testified before the uh, Little Hoover Commission in support of the governor's uh, Brown's proposal to reorganize state government to create a transportation agency consisting of the California Transportation Commission, Caltrans, uh, the DMV, uh, Highway Patrol, and High Speed Rail. Uh, this is a report that uh, will go from the Little Hoover Commission to the legislature and the governor within 30 days, and it's delivered to the legislature, and uh, if 60 days passes, um, it's automatically um, granted uh, for the governor, his reorganization. Otherwise, it requires a majority vote to reject the plan. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, the plan is adopted by the legislature and uh, we're in favor of uh, this consolidation of transportation in one agency. I think it will be very good for a policy direction on transportation for the state of California. Um, on uh, Monday the 30th, there was a transportation assembly transportation committee hearing that uh, Dan Richard and uh, board member Mike Rossi testified um, at. I think it went very favorably. Uh, included in the testimony was uh, Will Kempton, the chair of our peer review committee. He had um, quite a different story to tell this time. Uh, he was much, uh, uh, had very few concerns about us moving ahead. He does still 
uh, he and his uh, peer review do still have concerns about future uh, funding as well as the current staffing levels at the at the uh, high speed rail board but uh, it, I think all in all it was a favorable hearing and um, that that's the end of my my report I'm here to answer any questions if you have them thank you uh, any questions for mr. Flynn's I see none. Thank you very much, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the uh, end of our agenda today. We uh, have not uh, scheduled a meeting for June yet uh, in terms of having the date, so we can't announce that. Uh, please look for that. We encourage you to come, and we thank you for your participation. Thank you again for being here in Fresno and for my colleagues for coming down. Thank you. Thank you.